Yeah, my question for the teacher is, what is thermoregulation? What is thermoregulation? All right. Earlier on today, I said that we were going to be looking at things that are hot and things that are cold. And we need to understand that as mammals, we are what we call endothermic animals, which means that we control our own body temperature. If you were a lizard and it was a cold day, where would you go and lie? In the sun. Yeah, you'd go and lie in the sun, in the sun on a rock, and you'd warm up your body by receiving the sun's rays. But we're mammals. Our body temperature is not controlled by the environment. We have to control it from internally inside our body. So I want to use a very simple everyday example to help you understand this idea of thermoregulation. Thermoregulation simply means heat control. Now, something that I think we're all familiar with, of course, is our oven in our house, mm -hmm. right? Which has a very clever little piece of equipment inside it called a thermostat. What happens, and we can have a look at this little diagram here, is the oven heats up. We turn the oven on because we want to make our roast chicken tonight and the oven starts getting warm. But we don't want the oven to get hotter and hotter and hotter and suddenly explode. It needs to get maybe up to 180 degrees and stay there. So the thermostat measures the temperature. The thermostat sends a message to the heater and the heater is now going to turn off because it's got hotter and hotter and hotter doesn't need to get any hotter it must stay at 180 degrees and so the heater in the oven is turned off but then we open the door we put the chicken in and the oven starts to cool down and so when the oven cools down we need to measure the temperature that message needs to be sent to the heater and the heater needs to be turned on so that the oven gets back up to 180 degrees and by using this little thermostat of switching it off for a while switching it on for a while the oven maintains its temperature and i want you to think of yourself as an oven okay and you need to have this thermostat and do you have any idea where your temperature thermostat is in your body any idea where it might be sounds good all right <laughs> have you heard of the hypothalamus inside the brain yes if you've been Hormone. studying hormones at yes. school your hypothalamus should be quite a familiar word so let's see now Keeping the idea of the oven control in your mind, let's see what happens. We want to keep our internal body temperature between 36 and 38 degrees. If we become too hot, our cells are going to have problems because they've got enzymes in them. The enzymes are proteins and the proteins will denature, will start to cook like, like eggs and meat. If if our temperature goes too high. Likewise, if the temperature goes too low, our enzymes will become inactive, not quite denatured, but inactive, and they won't be able to control and carry out all the very important processes inside the cell. So we need to keep at this very constant temperature. So let's imagine that there's increased body temperature. To me, with his hat on under all these studio lights, suddenly starts to get hotter and hotter. He thinks he's just sexy hot, but in fact, his body is going into a little bit of stress because he's starting to maybe approach temperatures where his enzymes are not very happy, particularly maybe if Tumi has a cold or flu where he has organisms inside his body which are also causing a raised temperature and so he's starting to head towards a little bit of stress there well here's your own little thermostat inside your body your hypothalamus and your hypothalamus measures your temperature and how it does that is as the blood is flowing continually through the brain the hypothalamus measures the temperature 
very, very fancy, but very, very simple. Your blood's continually moving through your body, and so continually your temperature is being taken by your brain. So you don't have to stick a thermometer in anywhere. It's just an automatic thing. Right, now your hypothalamus sends a message to your brain, too hot, too hot. We need to do something. And what are the things that you usually do when you feel too hot? You start to sweat. What else? Can you take off your jersey? You take off your jersey, all right? You take off your jersey because you want to say, oh, I'm, I'm far too hot. Timmy should have taken off his hat. Okay, so you do behavioral things like maybe even jumping into a swimming pool or sitting in, in front of a fan. Or, or buying an tree. ice lolly. Buying an ice lolly, <laughs> eating under something the nice, sitting under a tree in the shade, moving out of the sun, yes. good. So we do behavioral things, but our body helps us as well. And what the body does is it starts to make us sweat. Now we might think that sweating is something, oh, yucky, but in fact, sweating is so good for the body because what it does is it allows a liquid onto the surface of the skin which then evaporates and that evaporation helps us to cool down. We also see that blood vessels dilate. Remember dilate means to get wider, constrict means to get smaller, so the blood vessels dilate and this allows the skin to become warm. Your skin feels hot. In white people, you see that they start going red in the face, mm -hmm. right? You might not see it in people with darker complexions, but oh, us whiteies, we just start going all red in the face and sweating and you go, oh, she's very hot. And all of these things help the body temperature to lower and to go down. Now let's imagine Amanda today. She went to gym and then she came into the studio and she was quite warm, so she was probably sweating, her skin was flushed, she was hot, and then she didn't put her jersey back on. No, so I'm starting to feel a bit chilly now actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. So her body temperature is decreasing. All right, what do you think is going to happen? That good old hypothalamus in your brain is going to measure the blood, Amanda, and it's going to say, oh, Amanda's getting cool now, but not the kind of cool she wants to be. We need to help her to maintain this steady state in body temperature. So everything that happened on this side of our flow chart, the opposite is going to happen. So we're going to see blood vessels constricting to limit the heat loss. And skeletal muscles start to contract and she's going to shiver. And that shivering is actually going to generate heat. So when you think that you shiver because you are cold, that's correct, but the shivering is just as important as the sweating. The sweating cools you down, the shivering, all those tiny little muscle contractions build up the heat. And so hopefully your body temperature increases. And it's this constant interplay of now we must heat it up, now we must cool it down, that you're not even aware of. I think that the human body is so amazing that all of these complicated things are happening and you're not even aware that they're happening. So I hope that that answers your question as far as thermoregulation is concerned. My question to the teacher is how is my skin linked to thermoregulation? Right, how is your skin linked to thermoregulation? I think from what we discussed earlier, you've got some ideas. So let's have a look at this diagram here because I think it very neatly sums things up. And your skin is either going to react to being too hot or it's going to react to being too cold and it's going to do the opposite in each case. So if it's too hot, the first thing that's going to happen is that these muscles that are attached to your skin are going to relax and that is going to allow these hairs to lie flat. On the other hand, if you were too cold, these muscles are going to contract and they're going to pull all of these hairs upright. And that means that even though you've got only a little bit of hair on your skin, it does trap a layer of 
of air, which helps to insulate you and warm you up. Now, we must remember that we are strange mammals. We are naked mammals in terms of hair, and we need to be thinking not only in terms of humans, but we need to be talking about other mammals. So I'm sure that you've seen cats and dogs and even, of course, birds. Their feathers will all fluff up to try and retain a layer of air, which acts as an insulator. We've already spoken about the, the fact that sweat is excreted and the skin is going to cool down when you're too hot. And we've said that blood vessels dilate to increase the blood flow so that we can have evaporation of heat, which we don't call evaporation of heat, we call it more conduction of heat and convection of heat away from the body. And the opposite is going to happen here. If we're too cold, the blood vessels are going to constrict to reduce the blood flow. But now, Tato, you had a very interesting question earlier on. Would you like to ask your question about sweating? Yes, um, I do understand that sweating um, happens to keep the body temperature constant, but I don't understand why people sweat when they panic. When so, you panic, yeah. all right. Now, do you remember learning about that hormone adrenaline? Do you remember? Yes, yes. Adrenaline yeah. that helped you to get into a situation yeah. where you could either fight whatever was threatening you or say, uh-uh, and run away. Yes. Now, once again, we need not to think about us in terms of humans, but we need to think about other animals. And when they run away, they need to get good traction on their paws. So if we think about uh, dogs that have naked paws, that sweat helps them to get good traction so that they can run away more effectively. So the sweating when you're in a panic has got nothing to do with cooling down. It's got to do with that hormone adrenaline and getting you into a position where you can run away quickly.